Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Segreto, and once again, so honored to be your moderator for tonight's In the Know Town Hall. Tonight's discussion looks at a central aspect of cancer research and care, and we're talking about clinical trials. Clinical trials, as you know, helps researchers find cutting edge treatments that are safe and effective for patients who are quite literally in the fight of their lives. Clinical trials help bring innovative therapies to market and ultimately save lives. And Sylvester, as you know, has one of the best programs in the entire country. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted this critical step in delivering treatment solutions. In fact, it has slowed and in many cases cut short hundreds of clinical trials in the United States. As you can only imagine, it's an alarming situation for patients who depend on them as their best and oftentimes last chance to eradicate cancer. So here's the question tonight. How will clinical trials move forward as we navigate this pandemic? And what are the cutting edge research opportunities at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center that holds so much promise for our community? Well, tonight, trust me here, we have brilliant, and I mean brilliant minds from Sylvester who will help us explore all of those questions. We will hear from Dr. Stephen D. Nimer, Director of Sylvester's Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Oscar de la Renta Endowed Chair in Cancer Research and Professor of Medicine, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the Miller School of Medicine. He will lead this question and answer session tonight along with Dr. Jaime Mershon, the Director of the Phase I Clinical Trials Program at Sylvester. He's also an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Miller School. Joining him will be Dr. Jonathan Trent, Associate Director of Clinical Research at Sylvester and the Miller School. And we will also hear from Dr. Justin Watts, hematologist and oncologist at Sylvester and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Miller School. But before we get started, let's go over how you can participate in tonight's conversation. After Dr. Nimer has delivered his opening remarks, all our panelists will answer the questions that you've been submitting over the past few days but you will also have the opportunity to submit questions tonight during the program live. And here's how you do it. At the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A feature there. Just send us your questions. And just a reminder for those of you who haven't been with us, for those of you who have, you know this, all of these questions will be done anonymously. And we will try, promise we will try to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can tonight. Now, it is my esteemed pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Stephen D. Nimer, Director of Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Nimer, it's always such a pleasure to see you, sir. Good evening, Tony. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to represent Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'd like to start by thanking all the incredible Sylvester faculty, the physicians and researchers, the staff, who have gone above and beyond to take care of our patients in this most difficult time during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you uh, inferred, uh, we uh, need to continue to take care of our cancer patients. Uh, cancer does not wait for this pandemic to clear. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that before I int uh, introduce some of the work done uh, by the other uh, members. Uh, the three J's, so to speak, Jonathan, Justin, and Jaime, and, uh, and to talk about what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, as a result of the COVID, you know, people have been afraid to seek medical attention. And so in the cancer arena, because of decreased screening and things, we predict that there may be 50 to 60,000 people across the country who are not rapidly and promptly being diagnosed with cancer. And so they may come back uh, and see us with more advanced cancers. And so it's very important that we have a full armamentarium of clinical trials, the right treatments uh, for everybody. Uh, we are the only NCI designated cancer center in South Florida. And what that means is that there are treatments, cancer treatments that are only available at NCI designated cancer centers. And so in addition to our phase one program, which is the only one in South Florida, we are getting some of the most promising treatments to our patients here at Sylvester uh, because of our NCI status. Uh, although we have slowed down compared to pre-COVID, 
We have enrolled 150 patients on clinical trials since March, and we have opened 43 new clinical trials. Uh, this has been a result of some really hard work by so many people uh, because of social distancing, because we've had a no visitor policy. It's all made it more difficult to put people on clinical trials, but this is so important to us that we've been able to continue our efforts and to, uh, to treat people with experimental treatments. Clinical trials is really our lifeblood. You know, with all the progress that's been made in cancer, people living longer than ever before, more cures than ever before, we also know that with the aging of the population, that there are more people with cancer and there's more people living with cancer. And so we need to have clinical trials for people at all stages. And so one, we are, and, uh, and you may hear from Dr. Trent, we're looking even at ways, new ways of diagnosing cancer, uh, looking in the bloodstream rather than having to biopsy tumors. Uh, new screening methodologies. I would point out that if you've been watching any TV, you've probably heard about Cologuard, which is the colorectal screening test. And I think the company figures that as long as you're staying home, you can order one of these things through the mail and get screened at home. It is a good option for people and, and uh, some better served by colonoscopy. We're uh, developing new ways of providing radiation therapy. We're about a week away from opening up our proton therapy center. It's a way of providing precise uh, radiation treatments. Uh, we're making advances surgically with robotic surgery. Uh, we are reducing the side effects from chemotherapy. We're being able to boost the immune system in ways never before, and you'll hear from Dr. Watts about some of the approaches that we're doing to boost your own immunity to fight cancer. Each and every one of these things is an advance that we're testing in clinical trials. And in the past, uh, the initial phases of some of these drugs involved testing things that barely had a promise to work. And now all the drugs uh, are promising. And the questions now are really are the new drugs better than what we currently have or are they equivalent to what we have? And so, so much of what we're doing in the, in the clinical trial arena is making incremental progress and sometimes massive progress. The clinical trials, sometimes they're our own ideas. We call those investigator initiated trials. Sometimes they're the ideas of researchers at other institutions and we cooperate in cooperative group trials. We cooperate with uh, treatments that are sponsored by pharma. And we cooperate with other academic centers in what are called multi-centered clinical trials. You'll hear about phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And those are the three phases that are necessary to find the right dose, to find the safety profile, and then to show whether treatment A is better than treatment B. And if treatment A is better than the existing treatment, then the companies usually go to the FDA to get FDA approval. And so you'll hear about FDA approval today, you'll hear about the different phases, and this is all the process by which we can improve on the manner in which we treat cancer. And then lastly, Let's just talk for a moment about how we accomplish all this work. The NCI designation provides us with about $3.1 million a year for the five years of the grant. So that's about $15.5 million. Uh, the state funds as a result of the NCI go up by about a million dollars a year. And when you're NCI designated, you can go and ask the NCI for other monies what are called supplemental funds. And despite COVID and everything else that we're doing, uh, we've been able to garner an extra million dollars just in this year alone for our clinical trials and some of the other cancer center needs. And so 
What the dollars do is one, they allow us to provide these new treatments. Uh, Dr. Watts uh, had a trial that made it to the New England Journal of Medicine, a very, the most prestigious medical journal. Uh, and so one is we can participate in these trials. The other thing is the speed for our, we're in a race. We're in a race to find tr new treatments for every patient that we take care of. And so it's very important. Uh, the more dollars that we have to support these clinical trials, the faster we can complete them and introduce things. Uh, today, I, I think you'll hear from Dr. Mershon, who you mentioned runs our phase one clinical trials program. He's also an expert in using viruses that infect human cells to either kill cancer or to deliver Trojan horses, something that allows this cancer cell suddenly to be sensitive to other treatments. You'll hear from John Trent. John Trent is the Associate Director of Clinical Research at Sylvester. He's a world-renowned sarcoma expert, and he has been leading a lot of our precision medicine efforts so that we can identify precisely what's driving people's cancer and then to intervene and, and block that so that the cancer cells die. And I mentioned Dr. Watts, who's one of our top leukemia doctors in the country, uh, has been studying targeted therapies for certain types of leukemia and also a immunotherapy approach called cellular therapy. And he'll explain how we're harnessing the patient's immune systems. Uh, we're delighted to have an opportunity to speak and to uh, address questions. And we're very grateful to you, Tony, uh, for keeping us uh, in line. <laughs> it's not difficult, but thank you, Dr. Nimer, so much. Well, we have a lot to get to tonight. A number of questions already submitted and the ones that you've submitted over the past couple of days. So let's turn our uh, self to all these questions. And Dr. Watts, we're going to start with you. And the question comes, why should patients with rare or complex cancers like acute leukemia seek their care at Sylvester? Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Hope you can hear me. Uh, let me know if you can't. Um, so I think, you know, for, for a complex or rare cancer, advanced cancer, and you could argue for any cancer, I think it, it's vitally important to be seen at an academic university-based NCI designated cancer center, as Dr. Nimer just alluded to. So you really have a multidisciplinary team of experts handling your case to make sure you have the exact diagnosis, the correct first treatment, which is so important that can never be gotten back. Um, and then the appropriate subsequent treatments to make sure you have the best chance of a positive outcome. I think in terms of leukemia, how that works at Sylvester is your care is going to be shepherded by a leukemia expert. And by that, I mean a doctor who only sees leukemia and who does research in leukemia both clinical and or basic science research, so has unique insights into, into the disease and has access to all of the most novel clinical trials. Um, and we have a very large portfolio of trials for leukemia and related diseases at Sylvester, which I can touch on more in a minute. Um, you're also gonna have comprehensive genomic profiling of your leukemia. Um, I'm sorry, the fire alarm's going off in my office, but um, I just stopped. Um, it's been doing it for about 10 minutes now, off and on, so there's no fire. Um, but you're going to have comprehensive genetic genomic profiling of your cancer or leukemia, which allows us to identify the targeted therapies, precision medicine approaches, and give you a more ac accurate picture of your prognosis. And lastly, you're going to have an integrated experience uh, between the leukemia and bone marrow or stem cell transplant team. Um, if you need a bone marrow transplant for your leukemia, we're going to identify your donor efficiently and quickly, and you're going to be able to go uh, to transplant if you need it. And transplant is a specialized, highly specialized procedure, um, and you, you really want to be at a center that has vast experience there. And I can tell you that we do over 200 transplants a year here. Um, and 
over uh, about 100 allogeneic transplants for acute leukemia, which is the most in South Florida and I think the second most in Florida. Dr. Wass, thank you. And God forbid, let us know if, you, if, it, if those alarms continue. Maybe you do have to leave. Let us know, okay? Yeah, sorry about that. that no, that, not at all. Uh, Dr. Mershon, we welcome you as well. Can you tell us about phase one clinical trials and why they are so important? Hi, Tony. Uh, thanks for the invitation and a, a good evening to the 118 participants now. It is incredible. How, uh, we are so excited to, to share with you our research and our excitement about the clinical research at Sylvester. Well, uh, phase one clinical trials are the earliest phase of uh, studies to uh, evaluate, investigate uh, new drugs, drugs that come from the laboratory, new discoveries, new uh, agents that uh, pass several uh, very rigorous tests in the preclinical animal studies, in cell lines, in the petri dish, show promising effects, show safety, and uh, phase one clinical trials uh, are the step that these new drugs that are discovered in the laboratory require to go into patients. So phase one studies uh, investigate the safety and the efficacy of new uh, medications into patients with cancer. In general, phase one clinical trials in the classic view have been uh, evaluated and uh, used to treat patients with very advanced cancers, usually uh, at the last lines of treatments. However, in the last five or six years, this trend has changed significantly. And we can see, and we are conducting phase one clinical trials, not only for patients who have failed any treatment or every treatment, but also for patients who are getting their first treatment with agents that are so promising that FDA has a, a allowed a, us and the investigators to uh, uh, evaluate the safety and efficacy in patients with uh, at earlier stages of cancer. They are important because they are this first step towards uh, uh, bringing new treatments from the laboratory to patients and to provide patients hope and hopefully cures. Dr. Mershon, thank you so much. Dr. Trent, we welcome you this evening, sir. Thank you for being with us. Uh, your question is, why should sarcoma patients go to a cancer center experienced with sarcoma patients? Well, that's a, a very good question and in a very important question. There have been a number of publications recently really underscoring the importance and role of experienced sarcoma centers in taking care of sarcoma patients. Um, for instance, when a, if a patient is seen in a small community hospital and has the pathology, pathologist make the diagnosis there and then comes to a sarcoma center and has an expert sarcoma pathologist, such as Andrew Rosenberg or Elizabeth Montgomery at Sylvester, it's been published in two different series that the diagnosis is changed significantly 20 to 30% of the time. 20 to 30% of the time, I myself have seen patients diagnosed with one type of sarcoma, for instance, GI stromal tumor, treated with a medication for that type of sarcoma, and then we changed the diagnosis to a liposarcoma, and the patient ended up being treated for a year with the wrong medication. So sarcoma centers, um, should review the pathology to make the right diagnosis. And then there also comes experience with patient care. And this goes far beyond sarcoma. If a patient has a heart condition and they need a catheterization and they go to a cardiologist who does 10 of these a day, their outcomes have been proven to be better. Similarly, there's published data from large cancer databases in the United States that when patients go to 
one of the 11 original NCI designated cancer centers that their outcome in terms of survival is more than 10% greater. There's also been recent publication on um, major sarcoma centers in that patients get uh, appropriate treatments, experienced surgeons. And I'm delighted to say that at Sylvester, we don't just have me as one sarcoma expert, we have pathologists, we have surgeons, radiologists, radiation therapists. In fact, our nurses and our nurse practitioners get invited to participate on national panels because of their experience in sarcoma. So we're lucky at Sylvester for South Florida and beyond to have this experienced team that is dedicated to, um, to further the field of patient care, clinical research, laboratory research, and education for sarcoma patients. Great, that's really, really something. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Neimer, in your opinion, sir, what makes a successful clinical trial? Thank you, Tony. You know, the successful clinical trials are those that um, take the most promising drugs and provide them to people who have the best chance of uh, responding. And so today I, I looked up on the website, clinicaltrials.gov. I typed in the word colon cancer and I got nearly 1800 different clinical trials that are going on in the United States for people with a diagnosis of colon cancer. And so number one, if you have colon cancer and you go to look at that, it's not that easy to figure out, you know, you could only be on one at a time. And so how do you figure out from that huge database, what is the right thing for you? So first of all, we, the, the doctors you're hearing from, uh, get asked to participate in clinical trials every week. And we need to sift through all the requests to find what are the things that are going to be the most promising. And that requires a dedicated career focusing on these diseases. Then once you have a, a hunch of what's the most promising, dr promising drug and you start conducting these clinical trials, then the next wave of promising drugs, the companies seek you out. And so not only are these people the best at sifting things out, but over time, the portfolio that they're reviewing to pick is getting better and better and more sophisticated. And so part is to have the, the expert people, then we get the best drugs, and then through precision medicine, we figure out who is going to respond to which treatment. And that's the critical. You know, in the old days, we would give a drug to 100 people and 10% of them would respond. And that was the only drug available. And so we kept treating them and we would see 10% response. And then we figured out that if there was like a specific mutation, maybe you have a 50% chance of responding if you have that mutation. And so then instead of getting 10% responses, some people get drug A, other people get drug B, other people get drug C. And in the end, so many more of the people are responding. And so that's what successful clinical trials look like to us. Uh, Dr. Nyman, we're going to keep you here because we just have this question submitted and we want to ask you now, when will Sylvester be joining NCI's ETCTN? Well, I think Dr. Uh, Trent will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have already joined and that uh, we have the same access to the NCI clinical trials network drugs. So uh, the answer is by becoming NCI designated, we were able to access this and we're now uh, getting drugs and treatments from there. Dr. Trent, would you like to weigh in on that as well? Yes, that's exactly correct. Effective September 1st, 
uh, we applied for and successfully attained an NCI grant that allows us access to the early therapeutics clinical trial network that's not even all NCI designated cancer centers. It's a select group of elite NCI designated cancer centers that have access to the most exciting clinical trials. And effective September 1st, we're opening um, 18 clinical trials that we identified in this network that we think are the best fit for our patients here in South Florida. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Watts, what are the novel immunotherapy and cellular therapy CAR-T approaches being studied at Sylvester, and how are these affecting patient outcomes? Sure, hi. Um, so there are two primary approaches to immunotherapy in leukemia and other cancers outside of a stem cell transplant. And those two approaches are one, using antibody therapies, such as bipecific or bite antibodies, which bring your immune system cell into contact with a leukemia cell to kill it. And it's a drug therapy administered IV. And the other approach is something called CAR-T uh, or CAR-T-like therapies. CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. And these therapies involve taking your own T cells out of your body or ex vivo and re-engineering them to attack your leukemia or cancer cell. And then they're re-infused back into the, in, into the patient. These approaches have had a lot of success. Um, they're very promising, in some cases even approved for lymphomas and leukemias, where historically they started. Um, they really work by reprogramming your body's immune system to, to target the cancer. Um, this, this approach requires um, really a team of experts and a lot of crosstalk between leukemia and transplant and ICU doctors and so on because they're usually done inpatient and they can at the beginning have a lot of side effects. Um, so it can really only be done at a, at a cancer center that has the infrastructure and the expertise to do it. Two even more novel approaches with immunotherapy are to try to expand CAR-T into solid tumors. They've been very effective in blood cancers to date, um, but we also have trials now uh, using T cell receptor and MAGE uh, technologies that are like CAR-T to get these approaches to work in lung cancer and melanoma. We have trials in colon cancer and Merkel, Merkel cell or rare cancer and also in gynecologic tumors. The last thing I want to say is that some patients can't wait for a CAR-T product to be made. Um, like I said, they take the cells out of your body um, and it can take up to four to six weeks. So a patient with acute leukemia might not be able to wait that long. So we're also developing what are called off the shelf or allogeneic CAR T cells from a donor. These are like a drug, basically. They're made in a lab and they're on a shelf and we can activate them immediately for a patient on a trial. And we have a trial like that for AML, acute myeloid leukemia called UCAR T123 because the T cells target a molecule called CD123 on the leukemia cells. And these T cells are also programmed to not attack the healthy cells in the patient's body since they're from an unrelated donor. So that's an another novel approach that we're pursuing uh, on a clinical trial at Sylvester for immunotherapy. Great, great stuff. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Uh, Dr. Mershon, you know, there is this old notion that phase one trials really only serve to assess the safety of a new drug and there's little or no benefit for the patient. Is this notion still valid? Is it still applicable or has it changed? Well, uh, it has changed significantly over the last uh, four or five years. Um, it is true that the, one of the main goals of, of a phase one clinical trial is to uh, confirm the safety of a new medication in patients with cancer, in, in the case of clinical 
trials for cancer. However, with the newer uh, treatments, newer modalities of therapy like immunotherapies, oncolytic viral therapies, or new, new targeted agents, we have seen uh, in the last several years that patients who go to these very early phase one clinical trials can have outstanding clinical responses that otherwise would not have uh, had with standard treatments. Just as an example, we uh, are one of the major centers to investigate a new drug for a advanced bladder cancer, which is a common cancer that is associated with smoking. And uh, um, with a, a drug which is a, a, a very complex drug, an antibody conjugated with a cytotoxic drug, where this antibody is injected intravenously, goes and finds the bladder cancer cells anywhere in the body, and they enter the cancer cells, and then they deliver the cargo, deliver this cytotoxic drug that causes tumor cell death. And this started as a phase one study, okay, for patients with advanced refractory bladder cancer, and we saw from the beginning that uh, after four to eight weeks of treatment, a lot of patients who were progressing on other treatments had incredible responses. So this moved very fast. And then we uh, participated also in a second trial with this drug in combination with immunotherapy. And we are seeing a response rates that are much, much higher than what it is uh, seen right now with the standard chemotherapy options that we have for, for bladder cancer patients. So to answer your question, the, the concept that the clinical trials, phase one clinical trials are the last resort for the patients is changing significantly. We have trials with novel vaccine therapies to prevent cancer recurrence in phase one for patients who have surgery and no cancer. We have uh, patients with a recently diagnosed a, a bladder cancer. We have for first line, second line, and we are seeing more and more good responses. So this is not uh, the rule, okay? There are uh, patients who don't respond. However, uh, the percent of patients who are benefiting from phase one studies has significantly increased. And this uh, uh, holds true both for um, solid tumor phase one trials and as my uh, partner in phase one research, Dr. Watts, can attest, also holds true for phase one trials in leukemia and lymphomas. Dr. Mershon, we're going to keep you right here. This was just sent to us, and the question goes like this. How do you know if you are a candidate for clinical trials or if you should look for one? Well, uh, th that is a very, very good question. The best way to determine if a patient is a candidate for a clinical trial is to be seen by a doctor who does clinical trials or to be referred, right? Uh, and it could be at the beginning of the cancer journey, in the middle or at the end. Patients, uh, uh, it will be important for patients to always think that clinical trials are a valid option for treatment. Here at the UM at Sylvester, most of our patients, when we see our patients, we always consider a clinical trial at the beginning because we believe that clinical trials the, the right clinical trial for the appropriate patient can be as good or maybe better as the standard of care. Great, thank you, Dr. Mershon. Dr. Trent, why is sarcoma different from other cancers? <clears throat> yeah, that's just a great question. Sarcoma is fundamentally different from other cancers for a number of different reasons. It's very rare for sarcoma, there are 10 to 15,000 new patients diagnosed each year in the entire United States. Compared to carcinomas, there's about 2 million carcinomas diagnosed each year. To make sarcoma even more complicated is there are now 175 different types, and each type is different from each other one as if they were different cancers. For instance, angiosarcoma is as different to liposarcoma as 
breast cancer is to colon cancer. And then there's also a fundamental, fundamental biological difference. Sarcomas arise from the deeper tissues. Carcinomas arise in the lining cells. For instance, when somebody smokes, tobacco hits the lining of the lung, damages the cell, turns it into cancer. Similar to the skin, sun damages the skin and turns it to a cancer. Well, sarcoma arises in deeper tissues such as bone, cartilage, blood vessel, nerves, muscle, all of these structures. Um, many times we don't know what the cause is, but many of the sarcomas are caused by specific genetic DNA damaging events that um, are called mutations. And these mutations make a number of different sarcoma types susceptible to the precision medicine or targeted therapy approaches that we've uh, been hearing about tonight. And so that you can identify through, through our precision medicine program at Sylvester, we can identify through tumor tissue or through a blood test called circulating tumor DNA, we can often identify the mutations that cause the cancer. And then from our clinical trial armamentarium or, or other um, access to medications, we can identify the medicine that has the highest probability of helping the patient. In other words, we can identify a medicine that can bind to and turn off that mutated pathway to reverse the effects of the DNA mutation on the cancer. And for instance, in one sarcoma type called gastrointestinal stromal tumor, this approach is effective in 90% of the patients when you pair the mutation with the right medication. And so sarcoma is also different um, from some solid tumors because now we have, um, we're on the verge of discovering effective immunotherapies for certain subtypes of, of sarcoma as well. Uh, Dr. Trent, we're going to keep you here because you mentioned precision medicine. So this question was just sent to us. Um, is precision medicine being used currently for sarcoma on the scalp to help the surgeon prior to surgery? Yeah, this is a great question. And precision medicine is used in, in many different contexts. It can be used. And, and so what is precision medicine? Precision medicine is really identifying what is the precise driver of the cancer. Usually it's a mutation in a gene or a translocation in a gene. There can be other, other drivers, but identifying that driver and then precisely pairing it with a medication that targets that in a very specific, precise, and targeted way. That's the current context of, of precision medicine. And we use it in clinical trials. Patients um, at Sylvester, we were able to get state and local funding to support performing these precision medicine approaches through a process called next generation sequencing on our patients here in South Florida. More recently, we were able to get grant funding to allow access to circulating tumor DNA, because now we have the technology to be able to detect DNA that is shed by the tumor, from the tumor into the tumor blood vessels, into the general blood, and we have the technology to get that DNA out, sequence it, identify the cancer-causing mutations. And we're doing this here at Sylvester um, in South Florida, um, supported by our community and tremendously supported by the Cancer Center and Dr. Nimer. And so um, we usually, the com most common use is to identify a medication for a patient um, the, and the, I, or identify the optimal medication for the patient so that you're just not trying drugs in the dark. It's certainly, there are um, clinical trials and exploratory research using this technology to detect cancer before it can, before a patient gets a symptom. 
We participated in the GRAIL study, which took in 15,000 normal volunteers and some cancer patients to detect cancer before a patient has a symptom, before it shows up on a CT scan. And certainly it's being looked at as well in cerebrospinal fluid. But as far as detecting cancer at a surgical margin, um, that we have not developed the technology to be able to do that. That's not, uh, not, not been done to my knowledge, but I think it's a fascinating concept in order to help, help surgeons uh, perform complicated sarcoma surgeries. Dr. Trent, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Neimer, what new innovative ideas are you currently most enthusiastic about and what are your hopes for the future of Sylvester's clinical trials program? You know, Tony, I think there's two areas to cover. One, we've learned over time that uh, oftentimes cancer cells don't grow faster than normal cells. The problem is that cancer cells don't die as readily as normal cells die and turn over. And so we've developed some drugs. There's a drug called venataclax, for instance, which fundamentally prevents the cancer cell from surviving. And so we find, as Dr. Trent said, the Achilles heel of these different cancers. And so one is the approaches that directly kill the cancer with these drugs. And the second, which you've heard about, is the immunotherapy. So we've learned that there's a battle between the immune system and the cancer. The cancer tries to camouflage itself from the immune system so that it's not recognizable. And so there's two things. One, we know that there's drugs that can strip off the camouflage and suddenly make the cancer cell recognized by the immune system. And second, even when it's recognized, sometimes we refer to something uh, called uh, immune system exhaustion or T cell exhaustion. So you can have some immune cells in your body and for the, all the appearances, they should be able to kill the cancer, but they're just exhausted in their ability to kill. And so we have just actually hired two brilliant young immunologists, one of whom is focused completely on understanding how does the immune system get exhausted? Sometimes it gets exhausted from multiple rounds of chemotherapy. And so if we can then rejuvenate the immune system, strip off the camouflage, and get the cancer cell to be recognized and killed, that's what's leading to some of the new cures. You know, I've talked before, and I love to talk about President Jimmy Carter, whose melanoma was in his liver and in his brain, and that would have been a death sentence, except when he got his melanoma, the immunotherapy had reached the point where it was curing 20%. It's now curing over 40% of people with melanoma that spread throughout the body. And that's what I'm very excited about. Dr. Neimer, we're going to keep you right here because this was just sent to us. And the question goes like this. Does Sylvester have any experience using CAR T or other novel treatment protocols for acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Yes. So Dr. Watts talked about the CAR T cell approach. Uh, there's a young woman, I believe she's now more than a decade out from her treatment at the University of Pennsylvania. She was the first CAR T cell for childhood ALL, and that was a miracle. Uh, in childhood ALL, this approach is curing over 90% of children. Uh, with this rare form of leukemia. And we have one of the biggest programs in the country of CAR T cell in lymphoma uh, that we've participated repeatedly in these trials. And our success and our ability to enroll patients on these trials has led us to be one of the preferred centers in the United States for the future CAR T cell uh, programs that Dr. Watts talked about, uh, things that are promising in brain tumors, in other solid tumors. Uh, and so the answer to that is a resounding yes. 
Thank you, Dr. Neimer. Dr. Watts, we're going to bring you back in. Uh, for patients with blood cancers, what is unique about the clinical trials that Sylvester can offer? Hi, that's a, a great question. Um, well, in addition um, to immunotherapy, which I've talked about a bit, what I haven't mentioned much are targeted therapies, drug therapies for leukemia. Um, these are really the backbone of therapy for leukemia. It used to be primarily chemotherapy, um, which we still use um, in some cases, but we're using more and more targeted therapies. And I think um, an excellent of, uh, example of that is something called an IDH inhibitor or isocitrate dehydrogenase inhibitor. And about 10% of leukemia patients will have a mutation in this enzyme. So this is a precision medicine approach where we test for the mutation. If you have it, then we, well, five or six years ago, we would enroll you on the clinical trial. So we participated and helped develop this approach about five or six years ago in a first in human phase one clinical trial done at Sylvester that we did with other, center, other centers published in the New England Journal of Medicine on a phase one trial. Um, we still have patients on that trial five years later who are likely cured. That doesn't happen to everybody, but it certainly happens in a significant percentage of patients, um, which led to the drug being approved by the FDA based on phase one and then phase two clinical trial data. There wasn't even a phase, trial, uh, phase three trial done. It was so effective. Um, it got accelerated approval. And this is an oral agent, single agent. And we have 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds taking this drug, um, which is another great thing about targeted therapies. If they work, um, not only can the patient go into remission and potentially be cured, but they're much better tolerated, less toxic um, than the more traditional chemotherapy approaches. Great. Dr. Watts, thank you. Dr. Mershon. What is your vision for the phase one clinical trials program at Sylvester? My vision for the phase one clinical trial programs at Sylvester is that it uh, will become uh, one of the top uh, uh, 15 to top 10 programs in the country. And by that, I mean, we will uh, continue to work very hard and develop a uh, a new infrastructure, bring new brilliant minds to help in our efforts to bring more phase one studies, to bring more scientists to um, uh, uh, translate all the laboratory findings into patients. And uh, uh, for us uh, here at Sylvester to be a beacon of hope, okay? To provide hope for all our patients who need help and who need hope. My vision for the phase one program is that we uh, will have a clinical study for any patient that comes and sees us uh, and is looking for help, for hope. Thank you, Dr. Mershon. Dr. Neimer, we just have this sent to us. Uh, and the question goes, how should the public become excited about your plan for utilizing the proceeds of the new transformative $126 million gift to Sylvester in your name. Wow. Well, um, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the person who asked that question, it's, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I know we're not done, but let me just summarize for a second what you're hearing. Um, what we've been able to do at Sylvester you know, I've been here now eight years, but is to bring the very best people to Sylvester, to bring them together and to have them work in teams, to provide a great infrastructure. You know, for all the clinical trials that we do requires uh, millions and millions of dollars of investment. Uh, you know, we open the trial uh, in fact, most of the trials pay you by the number of people you put on a trial. And sometimes the trial uh, doesn't accrue as many people as you'd like. And so you're continuously funding 
the infrastructure to do this work. So what I would say is that this $126 million, it, we're going to use this uh, one to uh, build a formal research program called Experimental and Translational Oncology. And that's going to be presented the next time we go into the NCI for our uh, grant. <clears throat> we're using the money uh, to provide endowed chairs uh, so that uh, this amazing uh, physicians and researchers at our place know that they have funding for life. Uh, that's what an endowed chair provides. We're going to f uh, improve our facilities. And the one thing that I really want to stress, uh, and it's, it's a, a, a level beyond the reach of most people, but we've been matching any pledges of a million dollars or more, we're using the $126 million to match. And even though we've only announced this uh, about 10 days ago or so, we've been able to bring in nearly $20 million additionally that we are using the huge anonymous gift uh, to backstop. So our hope is we can turn $126 million into $252 million for our cancer center. And it's all designed to better allow us to help this amazing community that we all live and work in. And, and Dr. Neimer, can you elaborate while we have you here on how important and how philanthropy really elevates the impact and outcomes of clinical trials and cancer research in general? Sure. So, you know, um, Dr. Trent talked about uh, all the different types of sarcomas. So in the old days, uh, you had 20 people with a sarcoma. You had one drug, maybe one in the 20 would respond. And you could have one data manager to keep track of that clinical trial because everyone was getting the same drug. With precision medicine, those 20 patients may be getting 12 different drugs. And so now you have 12 times, uh, well, maybe you have six times as much paperwork to fill out and all the regulatory. And you need a pharmacist now is not gonna hand one drug out to 20 people, but the pharmacist needs to have all 12 drugs that are stocked and given out. And so the complexity of what we do has gone up tremendously. That if, you, again, these 20 patients, if they are put on 12 different trials, we have so many more costs that are not met by either the NCI or the drug company or the cooperative group trials. And so we're, continuously supporting, subsidizing these with money. That the rare diseases, the drug companies aren't interested in studying. So when there's a lung cancer drug that just gets approved and we want to study it in a, a rare disease, a certain type of ovarian cancer or something, the drug companies are not willing to pay to do those trials. Those are the investigator initiated trials. And so all of this requires support uh, in financial support and philanthropy plays a huge role in our ability to do these trials. The other thing I mentioned before is speed. So if uh, what Dr. Watts said is that there's, he's investigated a drug that didn't even have to go through phase three trials. So that probably saved two years and in those two years, there would have been thousands of patients who could have benefited from that drug who d couldn't get the drug because it was not FDA approved. And so as for people with cancer, they understand that the, the discoveries have to occur now. For many people, if they occur in two years from now, it's too late. And so, um, you know, after this call, I imagine that we're gonna all go back to work uh, and that uh, because it's so important that we have the people, the resources, 
the dollars to speed up this effort. Thank you, Dr. Nimer. Thank you so much. I'm sure you'll be working. It almost seems like you got to work 24 hours a day now. Uh, Dr. Trent, what are the benefits to patients of having clinical trials here in Miami in the South Florida area? This is a great question, and this is important. And again, I go back to the data. Patients who were treated on clinical trials have better outcomes than paired patients who are not. Um, you're not only getting access to cutting edge novel therapies, you're also getting access to additional healthcare, um, healthcare staff members, research, clinical research coordinators, uh, research nurses, a principal investigator of the study. So you're being a looked at a lot, lot closer. Everything is being monitored very closely. And namely, it's the access to new medications that lead to the discoveries that you've heard about today, the targeted therapies, the CAR T cells. Um, and there's, there's clinical trials that we are conducting now at Sylvester that the public doesn't even know about. Many community oncologists don't even know about them because the trials haven't been completed yet. And so it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time for clinical research. It's an exciting time um, for us to be able to provide access to these clinical trials to the community of South Florida. Thank you, Dr. Trent. And uh, thank you, 3Js, as Dr. Nimer referred to you at the beginning of this, uh, of this In the Know. Um, before we close tonight, we want to bring in Dr. Nimer just one more time uh, to give us his final thoughts. It's been, it's been an incredible evening, Dr. Nimer. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, I think we're all delighted to be able to uh, answer questions. Uh, there are questions we probably couldn't get to, but fundamentally, we appreciate everybody's interest in what we do, the support of the community. And I just want to say that the the people here, uh, Drs. Trent, Watson, Mershon, are among the very best in the world at what they do. And it's important to stress that. That's what the Sylvester uh, uh, stands for. It stands for a level of excellence. Uh, we keep each other honest. Uh, by working together, we can elevate each other. Everyone has a different perspective. And so when you see a doctor at Sylvester, you're not just seeing a doctor, you're seeing a whole team, a whole approach. And we are committed absolutely to getting better and better. And this clinical trials is why we're here. This is why we became academic physicians. And we're just delighted to work together uh, to find new treatments for cancer and to help serve the community. Dr. Neimer, thank you so much. And thank all of you for participating in tonight's Sylvester In the Know Town Hall. Once again, you know, after listening to our truly incredible doctors tonight, I think you'll all agree that Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center is not just in great hands. It's in amazing, talented, and passionate hands. Our pride as supporters should be unmatched a truly remarkable and caring group of leaders and doctors. Please remember that a full recording of this program will be posted online. Look for that link in the coming days. And if you would like to support Sylvester's innovative research, visit miami.edu forward slash Sylvester. And if you would like to give to UHealth's response to the COVID-19, you can visit uhealthemergencyrelief.com for that. Now, in a moment, you will see a survey about tonight's town hall on your screen. Please take a minute. I promise you it won't take you longer than a minute to submit your feedback because you see, that will help us understand what your interests are and it'll help us improve our program. As always, we wish you and your family good health. We pray you stay safe. And remember, it's all about the you. Good night, everyone. God bless.